feet. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This is a funny thing when we'll be speaking this evening about God's power. And I need to snap. Does that not uh, show you a pretty good difference between man and God right off the bat? I get tired. <laughs> I think I'm going to sit down for a minute. Um, Pastor could not get back fast enough from his from his uh, little retreat with his wife. So uh, the bench had to step forward again to fill in. But I'm, I'm I'm glad he puts this confidence in me to do this. Uh, this evening, I would like to speak to you briefly about the significance and the necessity of serving an all-powerful God. You know, God God is many, many, many things, and He's revealed His Himself to us. and And one of one of the ways He's revealed Himself to us is through His power. And you know, we sit and we think about it, and we think mostly, uh, to me, I, I always am guilty of thinking about God's power in relationship to the universe and, and the things that we see. You know, God speaks, spoke the universe into existence. Just by simply speaking, the universe came into existence. And then when you, the more you learn about the universe and the more you look up, you start to appreciate and have a realization of just how powerful God is. Who just through speaking causes that to happen. And in the believer's heart, it should create awe and a fearsome reverence for who God is. And I feel sorry for those who have eyes that see nothing but chaos, yet we see God in those things. And I think a word that gets used too often, and it has been used to death in our culture and our society, is the word awesome. In our culture, we go, man, these chocolate chip cookies are awesome. Oh, but these, oh, that, 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 that's cherry pie. That's just awesome. And we, we've used that word to the point to where it's meaningless. And awesome is a word that really should only apply to God and his power. But we've cheapened that word to the point to where, well, I, oh, by the way, I stopped at the grocery store and got that, so you didn't, have, well, that's awesome, thank you. No, Missy doesn't say that, but I'm just saying that's things that, just how we take words that are really almost words that only should apply to God, and we've cheapened them and we've used them to the point to where they're just almost meaningless anymore. And what I want to do this evening is sort of focus ourselves on an all-powerful God and why that's important to every believer. So let's start at the end of the book in Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Because when you really start searching... And studying the power of God, it uh, it humbles you. It really focuses you and humbles you. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. Revelations 19, Revelation 19 and verse 6. And the Bible says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude... And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
Now, I, I looked and looked and looked, and I didn't see anywhere else in Scripture. And I could be, and if I'm wrong, I, I, if you know other than that, you let me know where that word omnipotent is used. I, that's the only place that I found in Scripture where that word omnipotent is used. And of course, omni meaning all, potent meaning powerful. He is all powerful. Now, what we have to understand about when we say God is all powerful, he has what no creature has. Remember, there's creature language and there's creator language. He, he possesses what no creature has. An incomprehensible, incomprehensible amount of power. Absolute potency. Absolute potency. He is the sum total of power. If you could measure it, he is the sum total of power. And I'm telling you, you cannot measure it because it fits in with other attributes that he has. He's the sum total of power. Here's something about God that we need to really think about. His power has never and will never diminish. That means it's outside of time as far as we know what time is. His power is never diminished. It never needs replenished in the least. When God acts, his power does not wane or fluctuate. That would mean change. And we know that God does not change and is incapable of change. So his power has never been less it never has been more. When God spoke the universe into existence, his power did not decrease from exertion or effort. And, and we, we look at the, when God created the earth, and it's, and it's set up like, on, and on the what day did he do what? On the seventh day, it says he rested. That word actually means cease. He stopped. So God did not need a rest on the seventh day. He simply ceased from creating. He stopped. And he also was doing that to set an example for the way we are to do things and the Jewish nation to do things later on. But God did not rest in a sense of I'm tired, I've exerted all this effort, I've exerted all this power in the creation of earth and the plants and everything, so I need to take a break. I need to sit back and rest a little bit. No. God would not be all powerful if he needed a rest or if he needed a break. It's not like our phones. You use that phone up and you see that little thing just go down, 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 down. you got to recharge it. We work, 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 and by the end of the day, we're exhausted. Our bodies just can't go, 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 go anymore. And the older I get, it seems like the quicker in the day that recharge has to happen. We all like that, aren't we? So God's power does not decrease from exertion or effort when he acts. Go over to Revelation 4. Revelation 4, turn back a little bit. Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to read uh, verses 8 through 11. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him, they sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him. They sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, 
for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So the key word in here that we want to focus on is the word almighty. Now, almighty is the Greek word for omnipotent. So when you read in scripture, almighty, you're simply reading the same word omnipotent. They mean the same thing, all power. And the word almighty is used in the Bible 56 times. And it is never used in relationship to anyone but God. There's never a place in the scripture where it said the almighty wind blew or the almighty sea. That, that word is used 56 times and it's always used directly pointing to God. So when we see the word almighty, we know we're seeing the word omnipotent. I want to read you something because this guy's a lot smarter than me and he puts it a lot better than I do. Speaking of God's almighty and his omnipotence, since he has all since he has at his command all power in the universe, the Lord God omnipotent can do anything as easily as anything else. There's no degree. All his acts are done without effort. He expends no energy that must be replenished. His self-sufficiency makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. All the power required to do, all that he wills to do, lies in his undiminished fullness, in his own infinite being. So this tells us that God outside of himself needs no power source. The, what, what, do, what does the grass and the, might, the mighty red oak trees, the, 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 the countless grass, the, the, everything we see around us, it needs and it has to have a power source for life. Amen? It has to have it. God is not so. All he is, is all the power he needs. And, and we must understand that that power is infinite. Is God infinite? Yes, he's infinite. Therefore, his power is infinite. Is God eternal? Yes, he's eternal. His power is then eternal. See, all the other things we know about God, they go hand in hand with each other. His omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence, they're all in harmony. And when I used to study these, I used to think maybe there's one more important than the other. In other words, maybe this is the most important thing about God, and then the other ones kind of fall in a line. Well, that's just human thinking, and that's just my false image of really who God is. All of the things that God is work in perfect harmony with each other. Now, it may be easier for us to understand them, maybe, understanding a couple of them more, and then it kind of falls in line in our little finite brains. But yet, they're all in perfect harmony. Now, we know that if we really want to know who God is, and we're striving to understand who God is. Where do we need to look? To his son. Right? Doesn't that make sense? If we want to know how God fits in relationship to his creation, us, and the world, we look at his son. Because God the Son and God the Father, God the Spirit, they're all the same. And they're all one at the same time. So you can't pull the Son away from the Father. So if we want to know how God interacts with his creation and his power, then we just simply look at his Son. Colossians 2.9 says that he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So that's why we can say, if you want to know who the Father is, you look to the Son. Because did, did Christ surrender any of his deity while on earth? Did he become less God than he was right now as he sits at the right hand? No. The Bible tells us he is the fullness of the Godhead except bodily. He veiled himself in flesh. He took on flesh form. But believe me, Jesus is just as powerful as we think God is. And think about the power that, it, that he had in his body all that time. And yet he, he veiled himself in flesh, took on flesh. I don't think we think about that enough. At any given time, that power was in him. The same power that sits on the throne is the same power that got dirty feet and walked the earth. Just think about that for a moment. The same power in his body when he hit the hammer with his thumb as a carpenter. The same power in his body when he got hungry, when he got thirsty. The same power in his body when Satan had the nerve to tempt him. Jesus was physically tired and weak, but he veiled that power in his flesh. And we're going to get into this a little bit later, but that power was in him when they were driving nails through him. Come on now. When pastor says he allowed cruel men to nail him to a rough cross, this power was still in him. He did not become less powerful and could not overcome what those men were doing. Does it make you appreciate Jesus just a little bit more? 100% divinity. No surrendering of any power, of anything. That's the same Jesus. Now, let's look at ways that Jesus showed humanity his power. What were some of the ways that he showed humanity his power? All right, the first thing I want to talk about is how did he show his power over his creation, nature, not man. How did he show power while he was on earth that he still could command nature? Walk, walked on water. Is that possible? No, supernatural, right? That took some power. Peter found that out. Oh, loudmouth Peter, he wanted to get, I want to walk out there too. Yeah. As long as he kept his eye. As long as he kept his eye focused. Yes. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we know in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, it shows his power over nature. He says, waves, I've had enough. Wind, I've had enough. Peace be still. That did not exert anything out of Jesus' power. He has command over nature, and he showed us that while on earth. Um, can you think of anywhere else? Walked on water, power over the storm. Do what now? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yep, that's power over nature. He brought Lazarus. We're going to talk about his his power over sickness and death right after this. His resurrection was, was power over death. But nature, think about this. Let's go back in the book of Exodus. Did you, you remember a fellow named Pharaoh that had some plagues? Uh, yeah. How about, how about uh, commanding the plague of flies? Frogs? What else? Uh, Locusts, grasshoppers, 
darkness. He had command. God had command and Jesus had command over nature and could use it to show his power. Yes. He showed it to Pharaoh. And some people, when they see God's power, they hit the ground and say, oh, Lord, my God. And some people, when they see his power, get just a stiff neck yes. and refuse like they haven't been shown a thing. Yes. Amen? Amen? Yes. They do, don't they? Yes. How about um, Israel leaves Egypt? They go to Mount Sinai. Do you remember when Moses goes up on the mountain and he's been giving the Ten Commandments and the people were down at the base and what do they see and it scares them half to death? Thunder, smoke, lightning, the earth trembles. And they're, they're down here and they know Moses has went up there and they see this force of nature God's presence on Mount Sinai and if you remember Moses comes down and the people go Moses we just want to hear from you yeah. they say don't let him talk to us lest we die so through his force and show of how he controlled nature the people backed away from Mount Sinai and said we don't even want to talk to him. You talk to us, please. Because if we talk to him, we're going to die. And they knew it. So we see his power there over nature. How about uh, when they're running out of Egypt? And what do they come up against? Sea. Red Sea. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's an awful powerful thing. For Moses, and God, when Moses says, just don't worry yourself a bit, we're going to go through this on dry ground. Mm -hmm. And through the power of God, he splits water, yes. and the entire nation of Israel goes in on dry ground. Mm -hmm. So God, all through Scripture, shows his power, and in the New Testament, through his Son, of his power over nature. And I think it is so ironic now we live in a day where man thinks he can control that. Yeah, How foolish. How stupid. With the, when he was talking to Moses up there, wouldn't uh, it count as him showing his power when the bush was burning, but yet it wasn't consumed? Thank you. I didn't think about that one. Yeah. I never thought about that one. That's another one. He controls all of nature. All of nature. So we see countless, many, 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 many times in Scripture where God shows his power over nature. How about his power over sickness and death? And we've, we've talked about this a little bit. Turn to Mark. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. One. Mark chapter 1, and we'll read uh, verses 40 through 42. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him I will be thou clean and as soon as he had spoken immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed so I how, I mean how we'd be here all night practically if we were to sit and focus on the time that God showed his power over disease and his healing power. Uh, if you go just to chapter 2, just go over a, a chapter and we'll read verses 5 through 12. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. When Jesus saw their faith and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And there was certain of the scribes sitting here and reasonable in their hearts, why did this man thus speak blasphemies? 
Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they say they so reasoned with him themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. We never saw it unto this fashion. So over and over and over again, Jesus heals the sick. He heals the sick. Chapter 7, verse... Uh, I've got the wrong reference there. But he, it, it is, is where he heals the blind man. Healed the blind, made the lame to walk. And this is, we look at this and go, well, that's not a real big miracle. That's just sort of, no. These people, these people, when you, when you compare this to the thunderings and the lightnings and the earth shaking and all that kind of stuff, we almost think that God's miracles to people were almost small things. Mm -hmm. But what did they mean to the people that he did it to? Right. Were they not thankful for an all-powerful Jesus? Because in those days, being sick don't mean what it means being sick today. I can get an ailment and a doctor can pretty much figure out what's wrong with me with the way they diagnose things and give me medication or give me things to pretty much fix stuff. But you know as well as I do, when a person was crippled and lame in biblical times, they were pretty much done. They were finished. And Jesus, through his power, restored, restored people's livelihoods, restored their lives. And finally, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 6. This is one of my favorites. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Luke 6, 17 through 19. And he came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went power out of him, and he healed them all. Just to merely touch him. He was so powerful that it healed them. Now, friends, that's power. That's healing power. When the power literally emanated from him to heal. How about power over Satan? Power over evil while he was on earth. Um, a while back, I taught a, a, a Wednesday night lesson on the demoniac of the Gadarenes. You remember that? And Jesus had just shown his power over nature by stealing, stealing the waters on the ship. Mm -hmm. And they finally came to shore. And when they came to shore, the man that was demon-possessed that nobody could do anything with yeah. and terrorized the village, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Bible says that the man saw Jesus afar yeah. off. Yeah. And what did he do? He ran to him. Now, folks, that's power. When that demon, demons, even saw Jesus from afar off, they sprint, they made a beeline for Jesus and started to beg for mercy. Now, you and I might not get a real realization of God's power, but I can tell you some people who do. Satan and his demons. It says they what? They know and they tremble. And they tremble. 
You're not going to fool a demon or Satan. They know. They also know their end. But when that demon saw him, he knew the power in Christ, and he knew what was going to happen. So he runs to him and begs for mercy. And they know they're going to get cast out. So they all start saying, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And Jesus permits it. He says, tell me where you want to go. And they say, just cast us over into those pigs. And Jesus permits it and allows it. And the pigs run over into the sea. But let me tell you what, that's power over evil. That's power over Satan. Anybody can think of any other times where he showed his power over evil? His power over Satan? Yes. Yes, he did, didn't he? Yeah. Well, who's another guy that Satan wanted to test and ask, and, and say, how do you get permission? Yeah. Yes, and we're going to be talking about Job here very shortly. But they know who has all power in his hands. Jesus had all power in his hands. And I'll tell you what, I'm glad that he gives power to me in John 1 12 it says but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the children of God even to those that believe on his name now that tells me that it took a little bit of power to save me and there's no other power but Jesus's power that can redeem me Bible tells us over and over again, you can't do it on your own, you can't do it this way, you can't do it that way. Only through the power of Jesus Christ can he take a poor, wretched, sinner, beggar, an enemy of God, and through his redeeming power, turns me into an adopted son. Amen. 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 Now, he also showed, while he was on earth, power over death. Power over death. Not just his own, but power over death. I believe someone said uh, Lazarus, right? In John 11, 41 through 44, we know the story. He lets, he permits Lazarus to die. And there was folks pretty upset with him, weren't they? when he got there. If you'd have been here, this would have never happened, Lord. And Jesus was heartbroken that his friend Lazarus was dead. But Jesus says, you don't understand. You don't understand. The things that I do, I'm doing so that you can see the power of God. And you can glorify Him. A little lesson in that for us. You may not understand what I'm doing. And it may hurt but you're going to see my power revealed through that. So then he says, roll the stone away. Roll it away. And he speaks to Lazarus. Lazarus's old, decayed body, decayed body, comes to newness of life. And the man hops out of there with all those old burial. That's power. That's power. That's the that's power that only he has. How about uh, Jairus? If you remember, Jesus was performing miracles. And Jairus runs up to Jesus and says, You gotta come, my daughter. You gotta come. You gotta you gotta help my daughter. She's deathly ill. And other people go, She's not deathly ill, she's already dead. Quit bothering the master. But he wouldn't relent. And Jesus goes to the house. She's already dead. And when he steps in the house, he's ridiculed by the family members. Who, who, what do you think you're doing? You know, what, what's, she's already dead. And what does he tell her? She's not dead. She's sleeping. And he simply speaks to her, takes her hand, and that dead body, 
is rejuvenated to the glory of God through the power of Jesus Christ. So we see that he has power over sin and death, not to mention just his own resurrection on the third day, openly showing people, no, 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 I'm alive. I'm alive and I rise with all power in my hands. That's power, folks. And, and, and as Pastor Scott was talking about last Sunday, he goes and leads captivity captive. That's why he says, I have power over death and hell. He descends into Sheol, takes all those Old Testament saints back with him to heaven. That's power. Amen. Why does he have the power? Because he has the keys. Amen. He has the keys. And only one can hold the keys. Only one. He who is almighty and has all the power. And this one I just never really thought of a lot until I, I studied it. We can see God's power even in his own death. So stay with me here. Turn to John. We see his power in his own death. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We see Jesus' power in his own death. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is not a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I, what, have my life taken from me? I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have, by the way, that's us, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So even in his own death, we see Jesus' power over his own death. And you say, how so? How can a man take the life of an all-powerful God? Think about it now. How, how can cruel soldiers with nails and a crown of thorns and a spear take the life of an all-powerful God. If a man could take the life from Jesus, man would usurp his, his power. No man could kill Jesus. You can't kill an all-powerful God. You don't have that power. Therefore, that's why Jesus said, I lay down my life. I give my life. Because I don't care how many centurions, I don't care how long he would hang on that cross, I don't care about any of those things, none of those things would have worked. Because he is all power. And you cannot take life from life itself. So even in his own death, he shows his power over man, mankind. And if you will remember, in Luke, on the cross, he says to God the Father, into thy hands I commend or I commit 
my spirit. Listen, listen. the Romans did not kill Jesus. The Jewish leaders and the Pharisees and all their scheming, they did not kill Jesus. No one killed Jesus. Jesus gave his life. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Man did not take his life. And you can blame the Romans, you can blame the Jews, you can do whatever you want. But we cannot test or take away the life of life itself and power. And you know, I think it's, do you remember also what um, Jesus said to Pilate when Pilate was testing me. Jesus said, the only authority you have is the authority that I give you. <laughs> so even in those circumstances, Jesus is going, bud, you think you have authority over this situation? The only authority you have is the, and the reason he had authority because he's all powerful. He's all powerful. That leads us right here. Since God has all power, he has all authority. Does that not make sense? If you're an all-powerful God, who can have authority over you? Or even have authority that is equal to you? So because he has all-powerful, he also has all authority. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given me in heaven and in earth. All power is given me. Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians, the first chapter. I want to read verses 19 through 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe? according to the work of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him, that filleth all in all. Because God is all-powerful, Jesus is all-powerful, he also has all authority. Not one thing escapes his authority. Not one thing escapes his knowledge, his power, and his authority. 1 Peter 3.22 says, Who is gone into heaven, and it is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. All things are made subject unto Christ. All power, all authority. Nothing escapes his authority. So let's just keep going with this line of thinking. If he has all power, and then he has all authority, then he has to have total freedom. Now just, st this one kind of bend your brain just a little bit. If he has all power, and he has all authority, he has all freedom. God is the only truly free thing that exists in the universe. The only truly free thing. I think it's funny. You've said it, I've said it, people say it all the time. Oh, to be as free as a bird. <laughs> Haven't we? Oh, to be as free as a bird. A bird lives an awful lot. No, sit and think about it. The bird is subject to predators. 
A bird is subject to hunger. A bird is subject to thirst. A bird is subject to disease. A bird is subject to nature itself. I know Missy just worries to death about birds when it's really thunderstorming real hard. She's always going, where do they go? What are they doing? She really worries about the little birds. Because we, we, we've got some birds that we've even named. Because we have got a bird feeder that sticks with such suction cups to the outside of our window. And we fill it full of seed and they fly right to the window and they're there eating and you're from here to there looking at them. And we've got little, oh, he's back. Yeah. There's two cardinals that we call Lucy and Desi. Yeah. <laughs> they, visit, they visit us every day, don't they? And Lucy, and, and then when the mockingbird comes, they all scatter. Yeah. And when the blue jay comes, that big old thing, he comes in there and ain't nobody going to come around the blue jay. He's the bully. But we, we say, oh, to be free as a bird. My goodness, a bird's life is... And they, you know that most birds are born, unless they're migratory, they stay within a one, one and a half mile radius of where they were born. Birds are not free. Oh, we're not free. Only God is free. And see, sometimes that sort of upsets us. And, and we don't like to think about a God with all power, a God with all authority, a God with all freedom, because one, we like to think we're necessary. We like to think we're important. And we like to think sometimes that we know better than what God does. Amen? Isn't that our, our just natural inclination? There's been, think God has, has allowed things in my life that I still to this day do not understand. I'm never going to understand it. But, being on the other side of it, I can look back and go, oh, now I kind of get it. Now, when I was in it, I didn't get it. And I was angry and I was mad. We've all been there. Because, because we like to think we know what's better for us. And if you, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but I'm going to. Job, we talked about Job a little bit. And you remember Job was, uh, rightly so, to a degree, went, went through a lot of stuff and started to doubt God. Started to doubt God in a big way. And he finally starts to challenge God. He gets to the point where he starts doing this. And he challenges God. And I think, I don't know, maybe in my mind, God listened for a little while. And then God just said, okay, that's enough. I've, I've, I've had it. That's enough. So we turn to Job chapter 38. Because in the first three verses, I think we see where God says, all right, I've listened long enough and I'm not listening anymore. Chapter 38, verses 1 through 3. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? That's a funny, that's a nice polite way of saying, You think you're smarter than me? You think you've got this whole situation figured out? I've got perfect knowledge. You don't. Because we see in verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. He says, all right, big boy, buckle up. You just get yourself ready. You've been challenging me. Now we're going to talk. Now we're going to have a nice talk. And have you ever, I know I'm guilty, when I was raising kids, they would do something wrong, and I'd be laying them out. I'd say, you can't do, you, I'm tired of you doing this, and I can't do that, and then, I'm done, and then I think I'm done, and I go, and while I'm on this subject, <laughs> right, and while, and while we're there, 
and then you talk for 20 more minutes yeah. on something that the first thing was done a long time ago. God does this to, to Job. He does it for two chapters. He says, all right, buddy, buckle yourself up like a man and take what I'm going to give you. Job says, or God says in verse 4, where were you? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Say, tell me, where are you? If you're so smart, you tell me. Or who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? And when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, where were you, Job? You want to point your finger at me? You want to doubt me? Where were you when all this was going on? Verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened to you? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare it, if you know it. You say, let me hear it. Let me hear it, Job. You know so much? Let me hear it. Verse 25. Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth, where no man is, on the wilderness, wherein there is no man. Verse 33. Thou knowest the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds that abundance of waters may cover thee? Canst thou send lightnings that they may go? And who said unto thee, here we are? And so he goes on, not only in this, he kind of makes it personal to Job here in verse 38. And then chapter 39, he says, he turns to nature. Who gave these animals these kind of instincts? Who told this animal, you are to do this, and this is your purpose, and this is how you're going to behave, and this is how this animal is going to work in harmony with another animal? And God just sets Job straight. He makes it personal. He says, you think you know so much? You think all of these things are because of you or you, of, of, of humanity? No, 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 no. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I have all power. I have all of dominion. I have all authority. So finally, after two chapters, verse four, uh, chapter 40, and we'll see what Job's answer is. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty, the Omnipotent, instruct him? In other words, just because you want to argue with me, that don't mean a thing. He that reproveth God, let him answer it. I want to hear your answer, Job. After I've told you all these things, I want to hear your answer. Verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Needless to say, Job got his comeuppance. Amen? Amen. Job got put in his place real fast. And even in this, God showed a lot of patience with Job. A lot of patience. He could have just caused Job to cease to exist. He says, Job, I have all authority. I have all power. I have all dominion. And you better adjust your attitude. You better adjust your attitude. Therefore, God has all power, all authority, all dominion, and he is sovereign. He rules and he reigns because, see how they all tie together? All power, all authority, all freedom, the only true free thing in the universe. And because of those three things, he can rule and reign. He's all sovereign. But yet, we, remember in Romans, where it says the potter puts the clay on the, the what, what's that called? It spins. I don't know what that is. The little thing spins. Huh? Potter's wheel? Is that, is that what it's called? I didn't know if that was more, something more fancy than that. Starts that wheel spinning, and he takes his hands, 
and he forms that pot and he says, I think I'm going to make a pot to store water in. Or I think I'm going to make a pot for a flower pot, raise flowers in. So the potter forms the pot. I'm pleased with it, sets it aside to cure. And the potter comes back the next day and the pot looks at him and goes, I don't want to be a water pot. Why did you make me a water pot? I wanted to be a pot of, that holds fine oils. Uh, I, I want to be a pot that, that, that has frankincense in it, that has a place of honor in our house or, or for this purpose. What right does the pot that clay have to tell the potter anything? Yet, that's our nature, isn't it? The pot wants to point to the potter, why have you made me thus? In that, we admit that we don't know who really an all-powerful God is. A God that has all authority and a God who is sovereign. Now, let's turn our attention to the future. This future may come tomorrow. Well, tomorrow is the future. But these events may come soon. How does God show his power during the tribulation period? How does he show his power in the tribulation period? How about all the plagues? He shows his power through judgment. Does he not? Will he not? If this book is true, then he's going to show his power through judgment. And we really don't have the time tonight to go into the bowls and the vials and, 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 and the horns and all the trumpets. But what is coming, praise the Lord after we're gone, is going to show a modern day display of of God's power through judgment. And oh, woe, woe unto those who are under that judgment and under that power. So God isn't finished showing his power. The the show will begin when he calls his children home. Let's go back to Revelation. And we're going to end there. Revelation, and we're going to uh, be for our chapter 11, verse 21. Revelation chapter 11, verse 21. And, and once again, we, we can be a little bit guilty of thinking that when God shows his power, that it's lightning, thunder, rumbling, uh, great exhibits through nature, and things like that. What about just the power he shows when a lost soul comes to know the Lord? Pardon? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Revelation chapter 11. Oh, yeah, I wrote down the wrong one, didn't I? <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, we'll talk about it. Um, during the tribulation power, his power and his authorities will be shown through judgment. And we look at that and we say power. But yet we see the power of God exhibited every day around us. When a lost soul becomes a renewed creature and a new creation in Christ, that's powerful stuff. That's powerful stuff. When God takes away addiction, when God takes away things of the flesh, that can't be done many times without the power of God. When God still chooses to heal people, I mean, there's how many times have you heard people say the doctor said, but God. Mm-hmm. There's power all around us if we just open our eyes and open our ears and really start to focus on it. 
So we know during the tribulation power that God is going to show his power through judgment. And then at the battle of Armageddon, how many are looking forward to the seat you're going to have at the battle of Armageddon? I don't know why, but I fixate on that. I really do. I fixate on that. I'm going to ride that horse, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to be in the clouds with him, and he's going to give me a seat, front row, and all of evil humanity and the forces of Satan are going to be gathered together in one place. And oh, by the way, he shows his power over nature when he said, birds, come on in, because you're going to have a lot to eat. Remember? Every time I see a big flock of those yeah. old buzzards, yeah. Yeah. them old filthy things, yeah. I always think of that. Yeah. <laughs> them birds are going to feast, are they not? And it's a grisly thing to think of. That don't mean it's not going to be true. Because he says he calls them for the, from the four corners of the earth in preparation. And I, in my mind, I'm always thinking, are they there weeks and weeks beforehand? And people are going, why are all these birds, countless number of birds here to feast? And I don't know what he's going to say. I don't know if it's going to be a sound, if it's going to be a word. But the Bible says through the power of his word, like a sword, all of those people are going to be immediately wiped out. And I'm going to get to see that. You're going to get to see that. We're going to have a seat. And I'll tell you one thing. There's going to be some rejoicing. There's going to be some rejoicing when we see those forces of evil vanquished who are trying to wipe out Israel and trying to wipe him out, his, his namesake. God is going to show a serious amount of power there. Amen? Yeah. Then I think, of course, all through eternity we're going to see examples of God's power. But we're going to see real creative power when he makes a new heaven and a new earth. Old one's going to be passed away. Is What's it going to be consumed by? Fire. By be consumed by fire. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So I don't know if we get to watch that. I don't know what's going to happen there. But I'm sure we will be in awe of the power that it takes to create a new heaven and a new earth for us. And the power of that new heaven and a new earth isn't going to be the sun. It's going to be him. Yeah. <laughs> the source of all power is going to be Jesus. Amen? So we see the future, the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, a new heaven and a new earth. And we look forward to these examples of Jesus showing us his power. We have to have a right understanding of who God is. Of, uh, of exactly how powerful he really is. And has how he has all power, all authority, and all sovereignty over me. Down to the smallest little detail. He has all authority over me. I cannot afford to have a wrong image of his power and his authority. And, and let me give you a good example. I've been studying. I've been going out to Field of Hope and teaching the last three weeks. And I, we've been talking about how important it is to think of God rightly. God creates his creative power. He creates the Garden of Eden. Perfect, perfect environment creates Adam, creates Eve. Everything was absolutely perfect. The, the, the nature itself, the animals, Adam and Eve were perfect. But what happens? Adam and Eve sin. Everything changes in that garden. 
everything changes to nature, to the animals, to them, to the actual environment they lived in. And the, one of the first things they did after they sinned, and this is, I think this is very important, they did a wrong image of who God is. Now, beforehand, they had perfect fellowship with him. The Bible says they communed with him and they walked and they talked. And as soon as they sinned, something happened and they got a wrong image of him in their mind. How do I know they had a wrong image? They hid. Now think about this. People who had a perfect relationship with God, knew his power, knew him for everything he was, they sinned and they go, he's coming, you get behind that bush and I'm going to get behind this tree and you stand still and maybe he won't see us. Now that's very deep. Sin gives us a wrong, wrong image and a wrong idea of who God is. And we can't let sin keep us from realizing how powerful God is, what authority he has, and just how sovereign he is over every little detail of our lives. When we get a true realization of that, we have better fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Every day we should do nothing, just pray, Lord, have mercy on me. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, have mercy yeah. on me yeah. and cleanse my mind yeah. of idolatry. Yeah. <clears throat> Remember, yeah. an image of stone or wood, yeah. an image of the mind is just as offensive to God. Yeah. 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 Aren't you glad we serve an all-powerful, yeah. all-authority, yeah. all-sovereign God? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've been in your word. Thank you, Lord, that you reveal so much of yourself to us in Scripture. Lord, I'm so thankful that we worship a God who needs nothing. Lord, who need, doesn't need me. A God who is all that he is in himself. And Lord, that you have all power and all authority. And I thank you, Lord, that you rule and reign. And this I ask your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.